ladies and gentlemen. Welcome the moderator of the last session at Habsburg stage of the day one, Steve Clemens. Hi everyone, I'm Steve Clemens, editor at large of The Hill in Washington, DC. I've been a regular attendee at GlobeSec here for a long time. And this topic about digital health, digital rules, ethics in the dig digital space has been one that we've been dealing with at GlobeSec here in Bratislava for many, many years. And I think what is, what is happening is we've seen a robustness of the importance of this issue grow. There are initiatives right now, I should mention, at GlobeSec uh, titled Transatlantic Principles for a Healthy Online Information Space. GlobeSec has, has invested heavily in this. Uh, and there are 10 principles, which perhaps we're going to be touching on a number of these. I won't go through them here. But I, what I will tell you is that about seven member nations, 14 different large organizations have signed on to these principles. And I'm told that down at the end of the hall, just on this floor, just down there, there is a banner of these principles. And if you believe kind of in this stuff, now maybe you don't, maybe you're one of the anarchists or, you know, you know kind of, you know, you know, game this a different way, you know, and we, we want to hear from all sides. But if you do believe in this sort of digital health, digital principles working across borders and lines, they've asked you to feel free to go down and sign that banner. So let me encourage all of you to do that. We have many, many guests online as well, uh, and they should figure out a way to get you uh, uh, an opportunity to participate digitally online as well. Let me tell you who is joining us for our panel session. Our three panelists today are all virtual, and I see all three of them here. It's great to see David Carroll. I wasn't sure we were going to have him. David Carroll, let me start out for a moment, is the Associate Professor of Media Design at the Parsons School of Design uh, in New York City. He is probably one of the world's most important crusaders for data protection rights. And I just want to put that on the table. He is a uh, uh, been the one who created the most significant criminal liabilities for Cambridge Analytica over his own voter rights profile. It's a fascinating thing. He was the subject of a Netflix show called The Great Hack. And so, David, it's great to see you here. We also have with us Renata Nicolay, is head of the cabinet for the vi in, in the vice president's office for values and transparency for the European Commission in Brussels. She has a fantastic Twitter feed. I have to uh, uh, tell Renata, I've been enjoying your tweets all day. I just know you have a great soul. Uh, so please go take it. And then we have Marcus, Marcus Reinisch, um, who's joining us also virtually. He's vice president for public policy in Europe for the Middle East uh, and Africa. So we've got different corners of this, of this conversation here today. And uh, I'm going to try to keep looking at the camera where my guests are. But all of you, I'm going to tell those folks that are online, you can uh, participate. And those in the room or those watching wherever, file your questions uh, in the GlobeSec app. And I, they will pop up on my little you know, uh, notepad here. And we'll be happy to bring them to you. We, those of you in the room can also pose questions. And you'll just do so uh, at the microphone. I think the issue of starting with the questions, you know, I'm in media, right? And I've been watching media become more and more fragmented and the kind of division, you know, the discussion of what exactly is media uh, is up for grabs today because there are a lot of players that do not have that, that, that DNA of objective distance in them, that notion of what public responsibility and accountability they should have. That's just the media dimension. But there are a lot of other players and there are platforms like we have at Facebook, uh, Twitter, uh, Google, but there are many, many others as well. And the rules across lines matter and how we kind of shape a world collectively together, particularly as I see it in transatlantic relations, dealing with some of the more insidious players uh, that are out there is very important. But let me ask David Carroll to help set the stage, if you would. David, you know, I, 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 I really respect what you did in sort of looking at the question of your own voter profile, um, which, which became part of the Cam Cambridge Analytica story, became part of a great series. I'm interested in what you think or the top two or three equities we should keep in mind as we discuss this issue of digital health um, and, and, and how to get it right as we move forward, as opposed to just necessarily relitigating the past. But g give us your, your, your top of line thoughts. Well, thanks, Steve. It's great to be here. Uh, glad I made it at the last uh, minute. Um, the big lessons learned out of, okay, great. The big lessons learned um, out of the Cambridge Analytica parable for the future is, you know, number one, the need for a global standard for data rights, the ability for bad actors to exploit the differences between data protection regimes uh, is a significant problem. And if we are to, you know, you know, basically data does not respect borders, it 
it em emanates around the earth like an atmosphere. So we have to understand it that way. And we risk uh, splinter net if we do not achieve um, a very strong global standard. The second issue is you can have the greatest laws on the books, but if they're not enforced, they really don't matter that much. And unfortunately, in the case of Cambridge Analytica, the ultimate victory of me achieving the full data request was achieved by an act of journalism because somebody leaked the database to journalists. Mm. The data protection regulator was not able to fulfill their task. So even the best data protection authorities don't have the tools or the skills or the resources to tackle the biggest challenges of the day and the future. And then this, the last thing is, the problem with my story is that it emphasizes this personal responsibility for one's own data. But data is a collective issue and, and privacy is a networked problem. And so, you know, it, it is not my fault that I had a profile collected, nor is it my fault that I spent huge amounts of money and many years trying to get, get at the, the tr truth when really it affected every registered voter in the United States. And we haven't really r r reckoned with the way that privacy invasions affect entire communities, even populations. Well, thank you for that, David. I want to encourage our three panelists to also feel free to react to one another as we weave through this. I'm going to get to Marcus in just a moment. But um, Renata, I want to ask you a question. As you sort of look at this broad subject of kind of creating scaffolding and a platform and a safe space for people's digital uh, rights and digital privacy and digital communications and, you know, just getting all of those features right. One of the things that I've been thinking about here at Globesec, because there's been a lot of discussion of China and Russia, when you think about tomorrow's global middle class, and, and David Carroll just sort of referred to this in a way about the fears of a splinter net, a lot of that is not going to future net added global value, you know, uh, uh, global middle class will not be in the transatlantic relationship. It will not be in Europe. It will not be in the United States. It's going to be in Southeast Asia. It's going to be in Asia proper. It's going to be in Africa. And these are places that if you don't somehow bring them into this conversation, if you did have a splinter net, if you create rules that work in one place, but China with, it, with its allies and its interests is not part of that, don't you think we run the problem of, we're going to get to the companies in a minute, but the companies being left out to some degree uh, of that growth. But I would love to get your thoughts on what we need to get right, because we often talk about setting rules up, but we don't talk about what the economic consequences would be if you've got a divided world. Thank you, Steve, for the question. Um, indeed, I think it's it's quite important to not forget the global dimension of what we do here, because you know this digital transformation that we all live in uh, is in the end something that will unite us all uh, much more and and facilitate global conversations, and that's why global convergence of rules is so important. Um, and I see a certain trend um, in that uh, direction. I was very involved in the making of the General Data Protection Regulation in the EU. Uh, we were first mover in that context. Um, uh, and But nevertheless, what we have seen in the three years since these new data protection rules have been in direct application is indeed a bigger convergence worldwide towards basic principles of data privacy. Um, and of course, it's always good if transatlantically we can kind of show the way. And today is a good, talk to, a good day to talk about that because we just had uh, President Biden uh, in town uh, for uh, an EU-US summit and for a NATO summit with very very encouraging signals that the US is back and transatlantic cooperation is back. But what we are seeing globally is actually a convergence, not only you know, in, um, uh, in, in the US and in EU, but also in parts of Asia. Uh, for instance, we have in Japan or in Korea, uh, a very similar data protection regime so that we could kind of consider these, uh, these parties even also in adequacy findings on our side. So our approach in Europe is really to contribute, to inspire others Others to contribute to a bigger convergence worldwide amongst allies. Let's not fool ourselves. There will be always, you know, uh, partners in the world uh, with whom it will be much more difficult.
more difficult to align because the basic principles of these strong privacy rights is that you know the individual is in the center uh, and you have your rights and you have to enforce them and you have to defend yourself against that mm -hmm. and that's not shared uh, across the globe but i think if we are united and work you know in international fora whether it's the united nations whether that's the council of europe uh, to aim for a bigger convergence that's also in the interest not only of the citizens worldwide but also of business worldwide Renata, before I jump to Marcus um, and we'll have a little we'll fun with that, I want to ask you a question. A few years ago at the Brussels Forum sponsored by the German Marshall Fund, I interviewed your, um, I think it was the EU Commissioner for Single Digital Economy, but he was very, he was responsible for some of the rules that you wrote uh, in the GDPR, which were just about to come online. And I, and I was talking to him about how Europe uh, regulated this sector differently than the United States. And I said, do you think in the rules and regulations Europe was putting forward, you would get a Facebook uh, being birthed in, in Europe or a Google or a Twitter? And he said, no. And he said it on the record so I can say it. He said, you Americans innovate, we Europeans regulate. That's our social contract. And so it was a, it was a provocative moment. And so mm -hmm. I just want to put that back to you because that was your, your minister who said that and ask you, what risks we what what do we lose uh, uh, risk losing if we're not careful about how we homogenize those rules? Because part of this discussion is also the incredible innovation in platforms that have developed in a remarkably uh, short period of time. And I just want to acknowledge what the minister said back then. But your thoughts, real quickly, Renata. Yeah, I think the, the situation has changed uh, compared to a couple of years ago, where really in Europe, we just discovered the digital single market as a key kind of, you know, objective on our side. I think uh, since then, we have quite an important discussion in Europe about digital innovation, even about digital sovereignty. And we see a lot of very promising startup activities and also a lot of investment flowing into this. And if you think about the recovery now after COVID-19, there's a lot of money also from the, the huge kind of recovery kind of money that we have put together in Europe to support our member states in the recovery going into the digital transformation. So I would argue that you actually are faced today with a more assertive Europe when it comes to actually, uh, you know, also uh, catching up with the United States on the innovation side. Thank you. Marcus, we're going to move to you now. And I want to say, before I mention another company other than Facebook, a while back I had dinner with Jack Dorsey of Twitter, and it was a private thing to talk about where the line ought to be and who should tweet. Should the, would the president of the United States, you know, be detweeted? You know, where do you, where do you draw those lines? How do you enter a world where you're beginning to make censorship decisions? And I have to tell you, and I, this is honestly, uh, you could see the anguish in his face. Uh, and so I don't think we should take lightly these conversations because where you put those lines matter. But I, I want to ask you, Marcus, about how you and Facebook, and I know you used to be at Vodafone, you know this world well, what are the ways in which we should be thinking that we might not know as you've approached some of the challenges of being one of the most popular uh, and one of the most impactful platforms when it comes to political discussions and political activism? But Marcus, your thoughts? Yeah, so first, thanks, Steve, and an extremely warm hello to Bratislava. But uh, Where know, are you right the, now, by the way? I'm, I'm sitting in, just overlooking the roofs of London. That's where, where I'm based and All right, uh, that's enjoying cool. the rest of London that we have. Um, but, you know, the, the anguish that you were describing that Jack Dorsey is displaying, that's the anguish that, that I display as well, almost on a, on, a, on a daily basis, because, you know, we are pushed towards decisions that are ethically very, very critical. And, and the question is really sh who should make these decisions? And, and I think we've said this, and I feel this personally, it's, it, it, it shouldn't be us. It should be democratically uh, elected um, uh, representatives. It should be governments. It should be um, the European Commission and, 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 and the co-legislators. And, and I think it is um, you know, a really, really delicate balance that you have to strike. You have to strike balances between you know, freedom of speech and harmful speech. You have to strike a balance between safety and privacy. You have to decide what is truthful and what is deliberate manipulation. And, and this is not, I think, a role that a private company can ever play. Mm. And um, I therefore really, really you know, happy to say as a European, as a proud European, that we do have um, a European Commission, a European institution that is actually going down this route, that is creating the frameworks um, of the 
you know, what safeguards democracy, what safeguards society. And we have sort of the, the alphabet soup of the DSA and the EDAP and so on. But, but these are really instruments that we need. And I just want to go back to Vice President Ansip, who said, you know, America innovates and, 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 and Europe regulates. You know, first, that's not true. I don't recognize this. There's a lot of innovation going on in Europe. But, but even if it would be true, you know, Europe has developed a muscle of good, and fair and cross-border regulation. And, and I think it's a, it's a very good contribution to make. However, Europe by itself will not be strong enough to build the frameworks, the global standards that David was referring to. And it does need the transatlantic partnership with the US. And I think, you know, that President Biden is currently in Brussels is, is a fantastic sign and that there will be much more cooperation to create a global standard and a standard as well that addresses I think the counter model that comes from China, and I think that is a, that is a concern for Europe and for America in equal terms. Let me. Uh, I think David um, has slipped off. I think he'll be back in a moment because I want to go back with a heavy question. But let me ask you both, Marcus and Renata. Uh, a, one of my best libertarian pals from Germany has just walked in the door, and so I have this, you know, sort of low rules, you know, don't get too obsessed with government mindset in, in favor of my friend over here for a moment. But as as I think about this question, and I think I typically think about political ecosystems as one where the product of political pressures, you know, the political gravity takes us to an outcome. And I'm wondering in this space, uh, I used to think as a blogger and the, one of the early political bloggers in the, in, in the early 2000s, I used to tell people I didn't worry about alternative truth. I didn't worry about uh, folks challenging facts. I didn't worry about scandals and, and, and uh, conspiracy theories because the internet at that time was so disciplining that people would jump in quickly uh, and fix and amend, tell me where I was wrong. But you began to see tribes develop and bubbles and people who had alternative uh, facts. And I'm interested, you know, as both a platform and as a government official, this is the big question I think we're struggling with at GlobeSec that is elevating democracy, democracy, saying we need healthy standards to preserve democracy. I sometimes wonder if you look out at a great number of people uh, in all of our countries, whether democracy is on their mind and rather tribal autocracies where the rules are the way they want them are just fine with them. So what, does the, what do the defenders of democracy do when an increasing number of people don't care about it. Let me ask uh, Renata and then, and then Marcus to comment. Well, Steve, I think you're putting the, the finger in the wound. I think, you know, we have far too long uh, simply thought that we can take democracy for granted, that it doesn't need to be nurtured every day, that it doesn't need to be defended by all of us every day. And I think not the least, you know, the events that we saw on Capitol Hill in the beginning of January demonstrated that, you know, there aren't sacred kind of, you know, statutes of democracy. We really have to be out there to defend it. And the other part I would add is that also your face as an early blogger, you know, that face where everybody thought, oh, this is all going to be a bright future where we just connect people. Uh, that's over as well. The naivety of, you know, the digital transformation that it's only good, that's long over. And I think what we are struggling with is indeed to find the right balance between what you can regulate and what you can't regulate, but where you need to equip society in a whole society approach to be better prepared for it. And, um, you know, just to kind of explain a little bit what we do in Europe about that, indeed, as kind of, you know, Marcus has said, we have gone out to kind of come with regulation, but it's built on a, a number of years of very strong experience of self-regulatory approaches, very close cooperation with the platforms, and, you know, in, for instance, a code of conduct on online hate speech or a code of practice against disinformation that was very useful for all sides to actually learn much more from each other and we have now kind of taken uh, you know a position to regulate some things for instance to regulate that platforms have to get rid of illegal content online and if not there are responsibilities and there are sanctions uh, are coming with it but on the other hand we also must admit that if we don't want to create censorship and also pay tribute to authoritarian regimes in that regard, we need to kind of keep the internet a free space. And that means you cannot regulate everything. There are limits to what you can do on disinformation with clear regulation. And that's where a core regulation approach comes in. And this is where Europe has developed or is about to develop an interesting, unique mix of regulation where it matters and core regulatory approaches in close cooperation with civil society, with media, with you know, platforms to actually address the vulnerabilities of democracy so that we are better equipped 
when there are disinformation campaigns, whether they are malicious, you know, coming from outside forces even, or whether they are just happening because in the echo chambers, that's what we risk. Your candor is really appreciated. Marcus, let me ask you that, that same question, but also ask, you know, as Facebook and, and your colleagues look at it, you know, these large, major global transnational platforms, do you see yourself as a place where, you know, you can have a federation of tribes and that's fine? Or do you see the dem democratic dimension uh, and the civil rights and the, you know, the civic justice elements of a democracy as sort of part of what you're trying uh, to inculcate with your users? I'd be interested in whether that's one of the points of tension you're struggling with. Yeah, absolutely. And I, again, I mean, I think I echo what Renate said, you know, we, we need frameworks and we're working on frameworks it's specific in Europe. We need co-regulation, but we need actions from platforms like us as well. We have a responsibility, not just illegal, we have a moral responsibility to keep people safe, to protect societies, to protect um, democracy. And, and, and what we do is, is obviously, you know, we tackle head on misinformation, we tackle head on hate speech, we tackle head on interference in elections, and, and there are plenty of measures that we take, you know, um, um, deleting millions of, of fake accounts every day, of expanding a network of independent fact checkers to identify misinformation, label it, demote it. Um, that, 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 there's so much that we can do. And by doing this, you know, back to your question, David, is, is we, 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 we are actually creating almost a, a global standard for this um, because we are the only organization that has that global reach. But also we have a counter trend. And, and I think you mentioned this before and maybe also accelerated to COVID is that we have much more assertive governments and they also become more assertive when it comes to digital matters. They come become more assertive when it becomes to content that should stay on the platform. And sometimes that content is regime critical content, that is opposition content. That is a really difficult situation for us. So we have this tension of on the one side, a cross-border service that uh, tries to reflect values of freedom of speech, of human rights and so on. But we also have assertiveness nationally. And we also see a fragmentation and we see this fragmentation in Europe. You know, we have individual content laws while we're trying to work on a global network and on a European network and then eventually hopefully in a global network. But what you mentioned is this tension is inherent and it plays out between our global community standards, which are the rules that allow what can be kept on the platform, what is taken off, between regional regulation and frameworks, and then national regulation, and then individual demands from governments across the globe. So it's a, it's a, it's a very, very difficult and heady mix for us. Well, thank you. Well, I think we've got David back online. There's David. David, while you were um, away doing something else, I asked the question of whether people online or increasingly in our nations, our citizens are as obsessed with preserving democracy as many people at this conference are and whether or not they want to see the ascension of their tribe and a different set of rules. And they're not really, they're really not empathetic or concerned across lines. And I know you are, and I'm just interested as an American citizen, you know, in this space, do you worry that bifurcation of interest that is out there, that, that design that we're, we may, uh, we make, make some mistakes. I mean, I, I just, I just, you know, as I sort of deal every day in the media space and look, the Hill is a very centrist place, which means we have all sides screaming at us. But when you kind of look at that, you, you see very different uh, gravitational force fields depending on where you are politically, how you think what matters, what you prioritize, how you see the world. And, and as we talk about homogenizing rules and systems that protect those individuals who really don't care about that, they care about their side winning. I'm just interested in what your thoughts are. Well, thank you. Um, yeah, um, it's no coincidence that um, President Biden's infrastructure plan is calling for improvements to broadband because I'm in a rural area and I'm having trouble with my internet here. Um, so even the basics still have a long way to go. But with regards to, you know, just speaking personally, um, during the pandemic, I relocated to a rural area and some of my neighbors, you know, have opposing political views. And so it's a really important moment to just meet neighbors and reconnect. We have an urban-rural divide in the U.S. that is further exacerbated by the, the ways that social media and digital marketing further segments us into like-mindedness for the purposes of bet better performing advertising measurements. And so it takes individual citizens to kind of work against this on very personal one-to-one -one ways. For me, the 
reason to pursue the Cambridge Analytica case was because I was very worried about the way that advertising technology and social media technology and the military industrial complex were all converging uh, to threaten the very notion of self-governance and self-determination. And so I wanted to lift a veil onto how manipulation was occurring right there on the surface and below the surface so that people could see. And indeed, when people see inside the machine, it is the most effective way to limit its impact. That once we can see it, it is less um, effective at dividing us. Let me <clears throat> thank you for that. Let me ask you all um, an another question. I would mention, I remind you all, you can ask questions through the app. Someone asked me a defense industry question, which I'm not sure fits, but I'm gonna ask it if we have no others. And you can also ask questions here in just a little bit at the microphone. But we have um, a, a great innovator from Slovakia sitting in here, the CEO of Tachium. He's a big giant in the artificial intelligence world. I remember talking to Eric Schmidt of Google at the time. He said, I asked him, how do you think you're gonna get the publics in our, in our world to trust AI? And he says, well, AI is gonna fix bad health diagnoses because the health diagnostic system is so horrible. That'll be the other side. The other thing it will fix right away is, is identity theft and fraud uh, and financial. He says, there are gonna be practical ways that AI comes in and changes the prospects and, and, and welfare uh, uh, of people. In this conversation, you know, as I listened to Marcus talk about you know, I don't know, the hundreds of thousands of people out there, I don't know how many you've got, you know, basically getting rid of the millions of uh, bad messages and whatnot, but it's an active thing you're having to do to remove those messages. And I'm just interested in whether or not we are locked in the wrong frame for thinking about this, that a lot of this online health could in fact be put in place by the advances that are coming in AI, the advances that are coming. Can we, can we build in to the systems we're producing something that more automatically produces healthy outcomes or is that, um, uh, is that naive of me, Marcus? Well, you know, first you mentioned this already, the AI system is not just there to help elites and to help tech technology companies, it's there to help users and, and individual citizens. And, Actually, ironically, the, the place where we deploy the most sophisticated and most AI is actually of determining and finding um, unto what content, hate speech and so on. I mentioned 97% of hate speech is detected before it is reported. That's done through AI. So, so AI is already built to benefit the user. But th there is no question that it requires much more transparency. And, and I agree here with, with David, you know, that's the concern. The concern, it is a black box and you don't know what's going on in there. And actually, when you look at it, it's relatively simple. If you look at your Facebook news feed, it's, it's fairly simple why things are ranked the way, the way they're ranked. But I do believe that there is a, a need for, for a framework to build sort of the ethical element of AI. And again, I'm coming back to this. This is not something you can leave to private companies. I don't think that is something you can leave to even self-regulation. And therefore, the attempts, again, here in Europe, and it, Europe is a, is a leader in these things, is extremely welcome to have a framework of how AI should be deployed by companies, uh, but also actually by public bodies, because it's not, it's, not just, it's not just us who deal with sensitive data. And I would argue that actually some of the, the public institutions, um, to think about health organization, health services, um, have much more um, uh, in, uh, sensitive data that with AI has, has, has potentially concerning outcomes. So I think tackling it through the um, through a regulatory framework, an open, transparent regulatory framework, um, while at the same time putting an onus on, on companies like ours to be transparent and to actually also recognize um, that AI is something that is used for for, for, for you, this is not to polarize people, uh, not to keep people on the platform, as often, often alleged, because we are an advertisement business. You know, right. we have advertisers that don't want to see the advertisement next to polarizing content. So there is an incentive to use AI for good and not for bad. Well, before I, before I jump to Renata to ask her the same thing about AI and how Europe uses it, say, opposed to Ch as opposed to China, or how Facebook uses f facial recognition as opposed to how China uses facial recognition. Marcus, let me ask you one other question. You know, Facebook has made the decision to say bye-bye to President Trump for a couple of years, and you went through a process for doing that. There are a lot of other autocratic leaders who uh, I remember when Emmanuel Macron spoke to Globesec, and he said very bluntly in English, 
the populace in Europe are lying to their citizens. And so I'm interested in whether that decision on Donald Trump leads to the necessary banning of other leaders who uh, mimic some of those behaviors. What are your thoughts real quick? And then we'll jump to Renata. Yeah. I, look, all our policies before the decision on Trump, you know, never allowed that public figures can incite violence. So, I mean, that's, that, that, that's not necessarily a change to our policy, but definitely what happened on the 6th of January in the US is obviously a, a pivotal moment. And we had to make this drastic decision and it was the right decision. And as you rightly say, this was a fundamental decision which we put in front of our external independent oversight board. Mm. And, and they came back and they said, look, number one, your decision was right. Yeah, you had to take Trump off the platform. Number two, banning him indefinitely, that is more problematic because there is no due process. It's not transparent why you did that. And back to you, you need to find a transparent process that you need to communicate properly. So that, that's, where we, that's where we ended up in there. But what we do as a response to the decision of the Oversight Board is to create standards for public figures that don't just apply to one public figure, to ex-President Trump, but actually apply to all politicians, to all public persons who potentially abuse the ability of the platform to communicate and thereby trying to incite violence and cause harm. Thank you for that. Renata, let me ask you to comment about AI and technologies as you see them. I mean, uh, Brad Smith, who's also speaking here, the president of Microsoft, wrote about advances in technology as tools or weapons. And so we're talking about things that can be used either way. But, but tell us how you think about you know, AI and other uh, techniques coming into the system to help perhaps right the ship when it comes to digital health and digital privacy and you know, digital accountability and responsibility. I strongly believe that we need to kind of structure systems where technology serves the people and not the other way around. And for instance, we are already using AI systems very well today in kind of, you know, putting order on the internet when it comes to illegal behavior. There has been even a couple of years back, uh, a global initiative to fight against child sexual abuse online. And here AI kind of was the solution to actually detect the photos very, very rapidly. So to just to show you that, you know, even before the hype on AI regulation uh, started emerging, we've been actually using it to put order in the wild west of the internet. Uh, but indeed in Europe, we have also put regulation on the table, uh, the so-called AI Act, which is very much driven by the idea of having, you know, an ethic by design, a human centric approach in AI, because we want to use uh, the chances of this technology. We want to have better health. We want to have solutions on mobility that are more adapted to our needs. We want to use it in all sectors. We also want to kind of catch up with regard to the huge investments that are already happening in the US and in China on AI. And this is a collective exercise with member states. That's what member states want to do with us in the EU and institutions. But it's very clear that we have to take a different approach from some of our partners in the world. We don't want social scoring like in China. We don't think that this is kind of you know, something that we want in the European area. So we have made a choice in this AI Act to also say there are risky areas where we either want to have a high level of regulatory observation and supervision because it can really turn it around when you're talking, for instance, on using AI in recruitment or in public services. You know, for that. And if you want to have a sustainable growth kind of uh, perspective on AI technology that is really uh, trustful and that kind of consumers and citizens in Europe fully have trust in, then you need to build it in from the beginning, as we have done with privacy, because the whole concept of the data protection rules was to have a privacy by design innovation. And that's what we are trying to kind of repeat with the AI Act very much driven by we want to support innovation, but in areas where we think they might be high risk areas, we want to supervise a bit more thoroughly. And as this is a technological revolution that is kind of changing every day, where nobody of us has the real kind of concept for the next 10 years, it has to be a flexible concept where we can also add high risk sectors that only emerge when we see the applications coming. So it's really an interesting way of dealing with um, a regulatory challenge, but it's a, it's a very common and, and united kind of front that has building up here in the EU where we say what we want, where we want to lead the way, hopefully inspire others, but also make a clear right. kind of difference between us and others. Right. And, and so just a few minutes, we're going to go to uh, questions again. There's some good ones being populated uh, over the app, and I'll invite people up to the mic here and we'll go as quickly as we can. But let me just finally ask David a question. And, and 
don't know exactly how to ask this, but I'm going to say, you know, David, if, you know, with our colleague and our friend here from, from Facebook, Facebook has developed community standards. It has uh, signed on. It's one of the signatory to codes of practice. It has made decisions that we've seen about, you know, political ads. Twitter and other places have done this as well. But Marcus has shared with us today that, that companies, even leagues of companies, cannot do this on their own. They need governments, they need partnership to do this. And I'm just interested in that legal scaffolding. If you look at the United States, the United States still does not have a national privacy standard. Europe does, California does, but the United States does not. There are a lot of things that Europe has moved ahead, just to go back to that minister and jumped ahead with regulatory approaches that the US government has not done. Uh, and I'm just interested, since you spent so much money fighting for your rights in the American legal system, just real quickly, what's missing? What could help move forward? And I'm not talking about companies. I'm talking about public policy, Washington, D.C. What, what needs to be there that's not? Sure. Thank you. Um, and hopefully my connection will hold. Um, the... The key issue, the one correction I would make, is I didn't spend a dollar of legal effort in the United States. I spent it all in the UK because oh. the, U the UK and Europe has the basic right to one's own data, the right to know. And we don't have this right in the United States. Now it's available in California and most recently the state of Virginia. This is the most basic building block to solve many of the above conversations, especially the one that was just going on regarding AI and accountability of AI. The key idea that we tried to challenge was the requirement of the company to disclose um, all of the key aspects of At least and, he um, okay, there he's back. Okay. Oop. Uh, oh, no, you're back. You're back. Keep going, David. Keep going. Keep going. I see you. Um, thank you. I'll try, try to get it out. Um, that the key aspects of the Cambridge Analytica case was how did they build these profiles? Where did they get the data sources from? Um, how did their algorithms work? Under the UK law, they were required to disclose that, and they managed to conceal it. So we still have a lot of work to do in enforcing the transparency that's already mandated in Europe and how to build similar requirements in the United States and other countries that are working on reg regulation to create this global standard, to create the adequacy of international trade. But the fundamental bedrock is the right to know. Mm. And we have so much work to do to make that visible to individuals. A key m moment that I'll try to um, c c capture uh, was when Channel 4 uh, showed a voter, a black voter, a black woman in Wisconsin, and showed her her voter profile and showed how she was marked for deterrence to be discouraged from participating in the 2016 election. And when she saw that, her response was, this makes me want to vote even more meaning in the 2020. And so the simple transparency of what is behind the screen, I think is the most important thing that we need to achieve first. And then all other data protection issues and AI issues and ethical issues and regulatory issues sit upon that. We need to make the data rights issues central to these conversations. Thank you. So, folks, what we're going to do now, I'm going to ask you to be as brief as possible so that we can kind of cook through some of these questions. Um, let me start with one from Joe just to talk about bottom line issues. It's just an interesting question I hadn't thought about before. He says, from an ontological point of view, do you believe there's something like a universal global norm of freedom of expression, including limitations? Renata, your thoughts real fast? Well, we have, you know, international, you know, human rights standards, even in the United Nations, and their freedom of expression is clearly included. And that's why, you know, I would say there's already quite a global convergence on the importance of freedom of expression. Where we differ a little bit is, you know, whether that's absolute or how it can be reconciled with other interests, such as security. Marcus, I think you, you would have thoughts on that. Is there a kind of universal building block in when, 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 uh, uh, Mark Zuckerberg put this all together. Was there sort of a unit of belief in that element of expression that was part of the DNA of your platform? Yeah, it does, it's the same answer. You know, there, there, there are global standards 
the the issue is here that we have either a lack of enforcement, you know, coming back to David's theme on on privacy, or or a, a different interpretation. And and sometimes the interpretation is, is 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 that people don't recognize some of these human rights and these rights of freedom of speech. But also, I think more subtly, um, and I think Renate made the point already, is that the absoluteness of them. And I think it's just, a, you know, as a European working for an American company, you know, there's, there's a different um, ranking of where freedom of speech stands, where the integrity of the individual stands. And, and, and I think this, this, this is normal because speech is a cultural thing. And sometimes it's impossible to really have deep frameworks that cover everything and they go across the globe. Uh, so it's a big, big challenge. And back to the question you asked before already, Odats, I, I, I think, you know, we, 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 we have to hold on to global standards in our, in our community standards, but that is, that is challenged on a daily basis. Uh, of course, what's going through my mind right now is Belarus and what we saw happen to a blogger and pulling down a plane who actually had that universal right of expression just going through my head right now. We got a question right here. Yes, go ahead. Hi, I'm Ayman Pena from Lebanon. I run a freedom of expression organization in the MENA region. How's it going? Oh, badly. <laughs> this is why I'm asking uh, Marcus. Um, you mentioned the great progress that Facebook made in terms of fighting disinformation through fact-checking networks, uh, fighting election interference, and fighting hate speech. Well, I'm inspired by a great book, Bewar Beware of Small States, by David Hurst, to ask you about supporting democracy where it's more fragile, where it's right. less established, where it needs to be further nurt nurtured. Yes, there is progress in terms of disinformation in right. other languages, but specifically election interference in smaller countries, in fragile democracies. Right. Under your jurisdiction, Tunisia, Algeria, Iraq, Lebanon, horrible. Uh, information marketplace. Same right. for hate speech and uneven level of attention right. during the Israel-Palestine latest conflict. Right. The attack by the hordes of supporters of Mohammed bin Salman. Yeah. So what are you doing to these more fragile countries in languages that are not as widely represented on the internet as English and other major languages? These are the places where democracy is most fragile and where we need to support it the most. Great question. Thank you. Thank you. Let me ask David Carroll for his thoughts. David? David, David is um, looking good, but we're gonna jump over to Renata. Renata, your thoughts, and David, if you can hear me, you can jump in when you come back and you're moving again. Okay, Renata, huh? Yeah, a very big question. I mean, uh, all I can say there is that, um, indeed, I, I, one of the, of the issues that we, and also in our code of practice, uh, where we are working, where we've been working in the past years with uh, platforms uh, such as Facebook, we have always made the point that it's so important not to do this only uh, in certain uh, jurisdictions, but of course we had an, uh, you know, an EU perspective, but already in the EU, as you know very well, we have smaller states and bigger states and different kind of languages. Going outside of the EU, um, I mean, we are very clear in our kind of cooperation with especially partners in the neighborhood, and that also includes the southern neighborhood and the countries that you were referring to, that we want to kind of, you know, also engage with partners there to address the challenges of the digital transformation and here also this is, this is the disinformation. But of course, we cannot regulate there. So what we can do is that to really equip us with our kind of initiatives that I have tried to explain uh, to inspire others right. so that also others can kind of build on that. But uh, yeah, otherwise, you know, yeah, I understand the problem. Great. Thank you. David, did you hear the question? Uh, it was uh, regarding um, the small international states, fragile standards. democracies and yes yes yeah yes, yeah yes. so we went to you first that, but you just stared at us so yeah yeah i'm sorry yeah my my, my bad con 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 no, connection yeah. today we, we i'm gonna have martin problem. call you up then get facebook to help you you know <laughs> <laughs> um yes i think that the small state issue is extremely important and goes back to the question of a universal data protection um, shield across the world that small states are also exploited by bad actors uh, for abusive practices or to offshore and la and launder data. So, for example, the, the last thing that we learned from the investigation into Cambridge Analytica is that they were in the process of offshoring to St. Kitts and ne Nevins using the C C Caribbean to shield themselves from da data protection laws. So we need to understand that Every citizen in every country deserves equal protection under an equal set of, of laws and, and rules. And then the pro problem that we also need to address is that advertising-supported public interest platforms are inherently 
that there's a tension there that what is good for a brand may not be good for a public society. And there are arguments that the brand creates an incentive to be good for society, but not at the expense of profit. So there are, we need more public interest platforms to compete with the commercial ones. And that's a huge challenge. Marcus, can I thank you? For that Marcus, can I ask you to share your thoughts with that? But we also have a question here from Ivan uh, that's come in online. And he basically wonders to what degree it's, it's, it's not like a small nation problem, but it's a small you know, company, a small everybody question. If you don't have the technological sophistication or the money uh, to invest in the kind of protections we're talking about today, he's just wondering whether that you know, is, is, is something where the bad guys and the villains always win. And, and I guess I would ask you, I know someone in this room right now who has, you know, one of the largest uh, followings uh, on Facebook from Palestine, particularly among young youth. And, you know, believe me, Mahmoud Abbas doesn't like this guy. You know, he's anti-corruption and pro-democracy and Abbas has overstayed his term by 12 years. So when you look at that, he's got a whole farm of people that that government and the Egyptians have aimed at him and every digital thing he does. And, and, I, and, and, and even Facebook has been in this story to someone. So I, I'm just interested in how even a Facebook can deal with government actors trying to undo the rights of those people who were worried about democracy and anti-corruption and trying to take it. How do we help the little guys succeed against the resources of governments that actually don't want the values we're talking about today? Marcus? Yeah, I mean, we, we can't be naive about this. This is, this is a, an arms race <laughs> between the bad actors and, 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 and people who try to, to, to stop this behavior. So it, it will never be over. And yes, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, this is a, this is a resource question to some extent. And I, you know, to make a very blunt point about this, Facebook spent last year the equivalent of Twitter's revenue in protecting the integrity of, of our platform. Um, I mean, that, that, is an, that is an enormous... Uh, expense to make. We have 35,000 people who, you know, keep the platform safe. That's, that, that is probably, I, I haven't really checked that, but it's probably the biggest enforcement army that, 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 that there is, an enforcement uh, group of people that, that there is. But I think there's a myth, and I want to just clarify this, that so if you're a small state, if you're a small group, you just fall through the cracks. I don't think that is right. And when we think about bad actors, there's definitely one, which is behavior. Yeah, let's think about it as a, as, a, as, a, as a bad actor, you behave and what we call is CIB, um, which is which is um, sort of um, uh, coordinated um, in influencing of, of uh, outcomes in, in, in a different country. And we spot that. We spot that everywhere. That has, doesn't matter how big a country is, how big a group is. These are mechanisms, these are, again, algorithms that help us to spot this. So every size of political or geographical entity benefits from this one. And then you have content on the platform. And that, yes, that is a scale game. Moderating content, again, raises the, the, the need for having a lot of people on the ground, for having the most sophisticated al algorithms. And it does become a challenge for others. And I, I, I do remember when I was on the same panel with uh, Renata's um, um, vice president, when, when she said, look, are you too big to care? you know, as a, as a platform. And my response was, we, we, we are just big enough that we can care, actually, because it's, it is very, very difficult to bring up these resources to deal with all these challenges on a global stage. That's, that is it. And, you know, if, if, if you think it's still not enough, think about our competitors or smaller platforms that come into this market and what challenge they have. Look, we've got two minutes left, so I'm going to ask you lightning round questions. I'm going to mention Globesec's, Globesec's Transatlantic Principles for a Healthy Online Information Space. Long title, too wonky. But um, uh, the second item in this says, empower users to make informed decisions about their data. I guess my question is, I know that David Carroll cared about his data, but I don't know if most people do. I've always wondered, you know, do we need a game app like, you know, Angry Birds, or we need something that a lot more people than attend this conference go through, where we educate about digital literacy, we talk about digital health, we talk about how they could be victims, so that you could get more of a demand function uh, going uh, on these questions that we're talking about today. And I'm just, you know, just real quick insights on whether you think, again, I'm naive in thinking that's possible because I don't see, again, gravity going the right direction. I see a lot of people overwhelmed by this topic 
and they largely don't care. They don't see it as something they do. It, it's kind of similar to health. I see a lot of problems in medical and health literacy. People just kind of forfeit, you know, responsibility to let others make decisions for them. How do you empower, you know, in, to, to go back to this GlobeSec uh, initiative, how do you actually want people to want this? David? The number one response that people have had after seeing the Netflix documentary, The Great Hack, is what can I do to protect my data? And I don't have good responses to that question. So there is a hunger for it, and the tools and abilities are not there. We, we, we get our financial information proactively disclosed in a monthly statement. Why, isn't our data, why aren't our data profiles proactively disclosed to us? Excellent. Thank you. Um, Marcus, your thoughts, and we'll give the last word to Renata. I would go in a similar direction. I, I do think, you know, there are people, probably as a fraction of population that, that doesn't really care, generally doesn't care, and there's people that care. But I think what is important is that the people who care have more opportunities to express that care and to have more control and have more transparency over, over the data. And I think that's sort of a gradual process that, that we work towards as a, as, a, as a private company with our settings, with our uh, product changes. Right. But also, I think that's where we go in with all regulations. Think about the Digital Services Act, think about privacy right. regulation and so on. So I think it's a, it's a, it's a pinch of movement that, that, that is required here. But more transparency, more control, that's the way to go. Thank you. Renata, you're going to get the last word. I think, Steve, I'm less pessimistic than you about the citizens in general. But I'm a I, journalist. I'm it's my job to be pessimistic. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> uh, but uh, on the other hand, I see a real task here, because uh. if we don't address the, the media literacy and the digital literacy in societies and at all ages, huh? I mean, there's a lot of talk about, you know, education, school education and, for, you know, uh, focusing on that. But you have to really think about, you know, all generations. There's also a vulnerable group of elderly people. You know, if we don't get that right, the digital divide and with all the kind of the difficulties that come along with it can really harm us. So I think we, we have understood that this is a huge kind of task for us, that along with regulation, increased transparency, we need to kind of, you know, really engage in uh, concrete programming and concrete kind of, you know, tools to enable users to actually be better informed. Because otherwise, if we lose them, we will not kind of find a way through that. Uh, well, listen, what a great conversation in a short period of time. I didn't know where this was all going to go, but I thought we actually did say uh, and, and reveal some very interesting uh, parts of this discussion. I really want to thank uh, Renata Nicolay of, of the uh, European Commission in Brussels, Marcus Reinisch of Facebook. I'm happy to friend you if you want, Marcus. We can become pals. And, and David, yeah, I'm a, I love Facebook, but David Carroll uh, from Parsons School of Design. Watch The Great Hack. It's such an important show. Thank you all. Uh, right now, our time is up. I should say that there is a program about to begin uh, with the Prime Ministers of Slovakia and Austria in the Maria Theresia room. It's going to be tough to get in there. You'll have a lot more fun if you just hang out in this room because it's going to run live here. But let's give a big round of applause to our panel. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks, David. Thanks, Marcus. Thanks, Renata. I hope to see you in person one of these days. That'd be nice. Bye. Very much. <laughs> <good to see. laughs>